guys, my name is Ravisha, and I'm an intern at Google, and my hosts are Ron and Gan, and we're going to be presenting WebBoot. A little about me, I'm from DePaul University back in Chicago. I'm doing a bachelor's in computer science, and I'm going into my third year. And then this is my pod mate, Louis. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Louis, and I work together with Ravisha uh, as interns at Google. Uh, I'm a rising junior at Dartmouth College in the East Coast. So a little about WebBoot. So imagine you have a laptop without an operating system. What would you like to run today? You can run any operating system that's unstored on web. You want to run Chrome OS? All you have to do is type WebBoot Chrome OS. You want to run TinyCore? You can run WebBoot TinyCore. The choice is yours. What WebBoot provides is it's like never seen before. You don't need the typical materials that you would need before, like a bootable USB stick, a CD, a DVD, or a hard drive. What WebBoot does, it stores everything in RAM and lets you boot any operating system you would like to. Uh, so WebBoot is an open source tool. And just like most of the things here, it's open source. Uh, and it's used to boot operating live operating systems from the web. So it downloads and loads a new operating system. Uh, WebBoot grew out of NEF, and NEF is the project that my team at Google is working on. And we implemented WebBoot in Golang. Uh, WebBoot is exceptionally fast compared to other methods of booting. And we actually timed it, and it took about 22 seconds to compile the user land and to create the init MFS. Uh, since WebBoot is open source, uh, that's the link to our repo. And if you guys want to contribute to our project, uh, we'll really appreciate that. So uh, before WebBoot, what were the typical steps of uh, booting into an operating system? So first of all, the classic way, you had to buy a USB, right? Then you had to download an operating system. Then after downloading an operating system, you had to create a bootable, of which this is sort of like complex to some other people who are not in tech. Uh, after that, you had to find the, a new laptop to sort of like boot the operating system on. And you had to change the BIOS to, to sort of like boot from the USB. Then after that, you had to boot into the new operating system. And in this process, you, you had to potentially risk wiping out your hard disk. It happened to some people. Then with WebBoots, uh, what you have to do, you just type WebBoot and you type the OS. So let's say you want to boot uh, TinyCore. You can just do WebBoot, then TinyCore. If you want to boot Ubuntu, you just do WebBoot, then Ubuntu. If you look on Google search and you type how to flash a USB, there's 66 million searches. 66 million searches to one. WebBoot, TinyCore, WebBoot, and EOS. So why? This shows, WebBoot shows that you can use persistent memory devices to boot any operating system you like. So what this does, it stores the operating system in, in RAM, and what it does, it goes to the next, and then the next kernel would be able to look at the memory that's stored and be able to take and extract anything that they would like, like packages, graphics, all of the things that the operating system has. It can look at it, and it can use it. It's a new way of booting an OS. And it also provides the user flexibilities. One of the things that my, uh, my, my host told me about when I first joined this uh, team was that two examples. Imagine if you're a journalist back in a, in a country that doesn't have that much privacy. And you're writing a journal art article, and a police comes knocking on your door. You can't, as of right now, when you close your laptop, things are stored in your hard drive. You can't just wipe them out. With WebBoot, you can have everything. You can shut off your laptop. Everything is gone, so the police wouldn't be able to have access to it. Software engineers, we like debugging things. What if you want to go into Chrome OS one day and just kind of, you know, kind of go in and look at it and debug things and then leave? Well, with WebBoot, you can do that. You can get into any user land you want and be able to do any of those things. Uh, so we have a little demo, um, and we'll show you that right now. Uh, so right now it's booting into Uroot, which is like uh, where we start from. Then somebody's gonna type webboot, then tinycore, which is uh, the version of the Linux we want to boot, then the boss to sort of like print out uh, any messages that come out. 
So my job in this was setting up the networking. So what I did was I kind of worked with DH client and I worked with downloading the entire ISO from the web. So as of right now, uh, our Wi-Fi is perfect. It can connect to any Wi-Fi network that has password or an Ethernet code. My DH client kind of looks for IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, this, there was an existing DH client, but we implemented it to, as long as it connected to one of them, we were able to download and load any other operating uh, and download the uh, OS from the web. So it's configuring it, it's getting the message, the DH client is getting uh, the message from the server, and after this, it's going to start downloading the file. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, this is a feed. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's going. Yeah. So, so retrieving the file. file is like downloading the file, then after that, it will get like into the tiny car, almost. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so downloading the files it was kind of like a little bit slow, but there we go. So at the top uh, corner, you can see it's sort of like loading extensions. It sort of like reads from that persistent memory device we sort of like wrote to earlier. And after loading extensions, it's, it boots into TinyCore. So, um, yeah. And it shows all the things that the TinyCore has. You can have a terminal. It has everything that TinyCore normally has. So like I talked before, mine was Wi-Fi and DH client. So what I did was we had networking stuff that we had to deal with. So my job was to connect to one of the interfaces, whether that was Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and then get a message back from the server and connecting that. After that, I started downloading the, um, the ISO from the internet onto a persistent memory device, storing it all in persistent memory device. Uh, then after she stored uh, the files in the persistent memory device, I had to sort of like mount that device on a file so that I could access the kernel and the initramfs files. Then after accessing those files, I sort of like had another function which sort of like processed the command line. So different operating systems require like different command line parameters. So we had to process uh, the command line uh, with respect to the operating system we wanted to boot. So you can either pass the command line parameters uh, as a flag, or we can automatically put them, we write them inside the command. Then after doing that, uh, I wrote the function to Kazek. It's Kazeking into the new operating system, and it, that's what loaded the new operating system. So some of the challenges that we faced, the personal challenge was not having a lot of documentation on persistent memory. Everything that we looked up on Google search or anywhere dealt with persistent memory devices with DAX. We didn't use DAX, we just used persistent memory devices. Another thing is security. So right now our, our um, web boot, we have an internal map and we have a link to Tiny Core. Or we would have a link to Ubuntu or any of those things. But web boot is supposed to provide users flexibility of downloading anything they want, whether that's Ubuntu version 1, version 1.1, whatever. But that comes with a lot of security questions. What if a hacker creates a new website that looks just like Ubuntu, has everything that Ubuntu has, and then wants web boot to run that uh, operating system. Well, that can be viruses, virus prune, and all of those things. So we really need help with security. Another thing is PMEM drivers are not enabled in most Linux kernels. So when we boot Ubuntu, they don't have PMEM drivers in their kernels configurations loaded. So it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? The first kernel has persistent memory in the side for the next kernel to look at, but the next kernel doesn't know how to deal with that. So that's another issue that we're running into. Uh, so the future work uh, on our project is to boot uh, more distros. Right now we can only boot TinyCore, and to boot TinyCore we had to use our kernel and enable the persistent memory and recompile the kernel to mirror that of uh, TinyCore. But for a distro such as Ubuntu, they are big and it's really hard to sort of like recompile their kernels. So we want to boot Ubuntu, Arc Linux, Debian, and Chrome OS, and some other operating systems. Uh, as she talked about uh, security is another issue we want to deal with. 
And lastly, we wanted to sort of like install it in core boot. Right now we are using um, a USB where we boot uh, from, but in the future we want to actually install it in the hardware. And, and then we just want to say special thanks to our team, uh, Ron, Gon, Ryan, Prachi, and Chris. Any questions? Yeah, please uh, queue up at the microphones again. I tried to build it and it didn't work. Can you come help me? <laughs> uh, you actually tried to build it? Uh, <laughs> you need to buy a support plan for that. <laughs> uh, I think we can look into that yeah. after the presentation. Yeah. Help you get it to work. Uh, I have a question. How do you download? Do you, do you use uh, HTTPS? Uh, right now... I don't think we are using HTTPS, but we plan on using HTTPS because it's secure. Uh, this was just uh, a proof of concept in a way, and we hope to develop it more and use HTTPS. Okay, yeah, uh, there there is a project called uh, Netboot XYZ. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it has uh, checksums and things like that that do not uh, require you to use HTTPS if you, and it also has a bunch of like yeah, the latest Ubuntu releases and Debian releases and things like that might be useful to corroborate on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll look for you after the presentation. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. How long did this take? So um, our internship was 12 weeks. So the first half of our week, uh, internship for six weeks, we kind of did a lot of research, kind of did it manually. And we looked into like persistent memory device because when we were doing this project, we didn't know how to work with it. First thing was we can just pack it all in the init RMFS and kind of load it, but then the init RMFS would become too big. So then we kind of came up and did the uh, persistent memory way and it worked. So we kind of went along with that. So the last six weeks, we kind of really tailored towards Wetboot. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna mention, um, they began the summer never having seen Go, they knew Java, never having built a kernel, didn't know what an init RAMFS was, didn't know what DHCP was. Um, in fact, every single thing you see up here is stuff they had to learn from scratch, which is why I was so impressed with this project. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ron.